Hi, my name is Thomas Infernus, a veterinary surgeon at the Animal Surgical Center in New York, and today we'll be talking about surgical instrumentation and how to care for them. This program is brought to you by Veterinary Instrumentation, makers of OR quality surgical instruments. Check out veterinaryinstrumentation.com for more information. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am Italian. I went to veterinary school in Italy, in Naples, for three years. After that, I got a scholarship to Spain. I went to Madrid for the fourth year of vet student, as a vet student. And then after that, I was transferred to Canary Islands beautiful place and I really loved it, enjoyed it, and I completed my veterinary degree in Las Palmas, Gran Canary. I went to Cornell University. I did um, a fourth year training, which was really, really, really enjoyable. I connected with the uh, United States um, veterinary specialist and that made me very, very happy because my main goal was to become one of the best surgeons in the world. So um, I did uh, Cornell, I graduated from Cornell, that was in 2006. After that, I was searching for the best place to be able to do a surgical internship and then a residency. So I found the Animal Medical Center in New York. That was my general internship, so a rotating internship. And after that, I went to Long Island for a surgical internship that allowed me to be prepared for the residency in surgery. So um, that was, uh, I was 26 and I, embrace this beautiful journey to be trained to become a surgeon. Very challenging, very complex, many hours of work, working every day from six o'clock in the morning to eight, nine o'clock, and then at times we're called in for emergencies and uh, sleeping two, three hours at night, and then I would start at 3.30 in the morning to study again to be able to sit for the uh, board exam, which was beautifully done. Uh, took me two, two attempts and then I passed it. I became a board certified surgeon and I did my residency on Long Island to New York. And then after that, I had a beautiful experience in working on my own. I opened a traveling uh, consulting business, which implies I, am, uh, I was going to multiple veterinary offices and I would go in and perform surgeries that were challenging that the general practice was unable to handle. And that was, um, that was an amazing experience because I learned how to handle pretty much everything. We started from um, you know really early in the morning and finishing up late at night. We had uh, 50 accounts with all over the uh, tri-state area covering Brooklyn, New York City, uh, Long Island, uh, Queens area. It was absolutely amazing, amazing, amazing experience. After that, I'm like, I want to make an impact. The way to make an impact is to have a brick and mortar place. So I decided to give up the traveling business and focusing on opening an animal surgical center. So we opened the animal surgical center two and a half years ago on Long Island. Uh, great experience. I was able to create an amazing team with a great mission, with great vision, uh, massive core values. And we grew from uh, five employees to 42 employees. And uh, just recently, last week, we opened a second location in Astoria. Uh, this, um, this is pretty much the same type of uh, concept, surgical only business that is in uh, Queens Astoria and, and is going beautifully. I hired um, multiple other doctors, they're helping in uh, building this vision to save as many animals as possible by providing excellence, uh, excellent service at a fair price. So in regards to my experience with instrumentations and setting up the OR, that was, I was faced with very challenging situations. The majority of uh, veterinary practices didn't really have any type of knowledge how to set up an OR and uh, how to really ensure that the standards were really kept to the high level. So what I needed to do is walk in the OR, set everything up. So between um, monitoring and ensuring that the place was clean and all the equipment that were required to be able to do my job. On top of that is the preparation of the instrumentation. So I, I, was, I was cleaning them up, I was prepping them up, sterilizing them, and then bring them from my house 
to the facility that where I was serving the, uh, the facility and then um, perform the surgery. So I had a lot of experience in selecting the right equipment, ensuring that they were inspected in regards to cleanliness, and then as well as really packing it properly, sterilizing it properly to minimize any potential chances of infection. So that was really, really good experience just because the car became my hospital. So today we'll be talking about surgical instrumentation, how to care for them, and how to set up an OR. The most important thing about surgical instruments is the selection. Highly graded stainless steel from Germany are the best instruments that can be purchased. How to care for them, follow the instruction manuals is super important and then how you sterilize them. So regarding selecting and purchasing instruments, what I found in my experience when I was, um, when I opened my own business and I didn't really have a lot of money, what I did, I went to this manufacturer, manufacturing company to select those, those implants and I found they were very reasonable in price. Even on uh, other, other online e-commerce services and websites, I was looking for these instruments and I, I was like, this is, doesn't make any sense. Very, very reasonable. So I purchased them and I, I realized very, very surely that the quality of these instrumentations were, was very, very poor. Starting from the fact that they were corroded very quickly the, the sharp edges of the scissors as well as all these other instruments were, were, not, were not maintained and that led to serious complications during surgery. And I can share with you, if you have a ratchet system, which is the clamping system of those, of those instruments, and you clamping a vessel, and the, the actual clamp is not holding, you're going to have major problems. You can actually compromise the outcome of the procedure. So it's extremely important to focus on selecting highly graded stainless steel instrumentations. They're corrosive, corrosion resistant, as well as ensuring that by maintaining cleanliness and proper care, you can increase the longevity of those instrumentations. Let's talk about surgical cleaning and sterilization. So there are several steps. The first one is pre soak them or washing. The second one is utilizing enzymatic cleaners. The third one is utilizing an ultrasonic machine. The fourth one is to lubricate them. And the fifth one is to dry them. After everything has been dried, is packed and then ready to be sterilized. So the importance of washing instruments is extremely, extremely needed to ensure that you don't have contamination. Mostly this contamination can lead to infection. Why? Most often, when you use these instruments for bloody procedures or any type of surgical procedures, they're going to be blood on it. So blood or fur, or there is going to be fecal matter if you're doing procedures close to the anus. And that can lead to potential staining those instruments. And then once you sterilize them, that product will be coagulated. And once they, you have the dry blood on instruments, even during sterilization, you're not going to be able to achieve that sterilization process that will be preventing infections. So surgical instrumentation must be washed properly. The most important thing during the washing phase, which is the pre-soaking, and roughly we keep them in, the, in this bucket with water for, I would say, five minutes, three to five minutes. And what, what the process allows any dry blood to be dissolved. And then after that, we use this special brush that just grossly removes any, any organic material that is being on the hinge portion of that of that instrument or the serrated portion of that of the of the jaw are mostly hemoclips and hemostats and then after that we lo we we place them in an ultrasonic cleaner the reason why we put in the ultrasonic cleaner is the ability to dissolve any small particles that we're not going to be able to visualize so they stay in roughly for 10 minutes after that we take them out and once we take them out we lubricate them. So we rinse them, I'm sorry, we rinse them first and then we lubricate them. And we use a special lubricant that is water soluble. And then after that, we open all the hinges, we open all the ratchets of these instruments and we place them on a drape to allow the product to dry. And why it's so important? Because if they're not dry, they're going to condensate during the process of sterilization, which can lead to corrosion and staining that can compromise the 
quality of serialization, number one, as well as the lifespan of that instrument. The cleaning process of instrumentations, please don't soak, don't soak those instruments too long. Utilize special enzymatic cleaners. They're made specifically for instruments. In addition to that, those lubricant baths, make sure they're changed frequently. So the packing of instruments, very important. Can be pouched or can be placed in a box and then wrapped with paper drapes. There are different types, so you can use towels or you can use paper drapes. They're both adequate. Most often when I tell my, my staff, please always double pouch or double drape. But the reason why it's important is because if the first layer is damaged for any potential reason, the second one has, has a potential protective protection for the contamination. So the way we do it is create a packs or create the pouches. They're all both double draped or double pouched and they're placed in the autoclave. Now, any sharp object should be protected. Let's say we're using a scissor. The scissor has a sharp jaws. So if you put on a pouch, that can lead to the perforation of the pouch and then you sterilize them and you're in the middle of the OR and uh, in the middle of the surgery and then you realize that that pouch has been entered or penetrated and that can lead to massive contamination because now you're sterile, the instrument is not sterile, and that can be a big problem. In regards to the paper draping or utilizing these metal boxes, what I found, because those metal boxes have sharp edges, they can break the or tear the drape and that can lead again to contamination. Another important factor to pay attention to is to make sure that those indicators of sterilizations are always placed inside the pack and outside the pack. Why? To make sure that there's a double check point. One is before you grab, you grab a pack, you need to make sure that that pack is sterilized. How do you know that? Because there is um, a special indicator tape that will change the color in black when it's sterilized. So based on that, you know whether or not the pack is being sterile. In addition to that, there are special sterilization strips. They are placed inside the pack. And the reason why they do that is to make sure the level of sterilization, which is the timing and the temperature has been reached. Because sometimes what happens is if there's a malfunction or electrical power goes away and the autoclave is in the process of getting this um, sterilization done and it's interrupted, the level of sterilization is not being achieved. So what do you get? You get a pack that is not sterile. So that is very, very important. Now, as far as sterilization processes, there are different types. Uh, you can use the cold sterile, which is what they use for minimal invasive instrumentation. And what that is, is basically you place the instruments in a bath. And then after that, usually you soak them for half an hour to, uh, to an hour. And then after that, you basically rinse them. You rinse the solution and then you utilize them in this in these minimal invasive procedures. Now, why they use cold sterilization is because the instruments are too long to feed the normal size autoclaves. Unless you have a big autoclave, um, the old generation of surgeons um, and people, they don't have the money to buy big machines. So I'm not going to specifics, uh, but we know the minimal time to sterilize a product is usually uh, 25 minutes, at 250 degree Fahrenheit. Now there is a flush system or flush modality of sterilization, which is basically shortening the time of sterilization, which is up to three minutes, with a temperature of 270 Fahrenheit. Now, what is the difference between the two? The fast sterilization, if you have an emergency, you need to sterilize your equipment very, very quickly. You do that, it's not ideal and actually impacts the longevity of those instruments because there is not a proper dry cycle. And the lack of dry cycle leads to condensation. The condensation will lead to corrosion. Let's talk about a little bit um, the difference between steam sterilization, dry sterilization, or gas sterilization. What's the difference between the two? Gas sterilization utilizes hydroperoxide or called the plasma sterilization. The other one is called the ethylene oxide sterilization, which is used for any product or any instruments that cannot use stem because it will be melting like plastic. If you have any instruments in metal plastic or reusable, you have to use gas sterilization. It's very effective. 
it releases this gas, it serializes them, and then we have a special uh, indicators that will prove whether or not the product has been sterilized. In regards to the autoclave or the steam sterilization, it utilizes vapor. And what the vapor does, it just penetrates the surface of the instruments, and that leads to really ideal sterilization, and then the pack will be ready for surgery. Talking about surgical instruments, so the scissors are very important. They're differentiated into thick scissors, which are the Mayo scissor. The other one is the thin, more delicate, that is called medicine bound scissor. So where, where are the differences? Is the application. One is going to cut thick tissues, the other one is going to cut very delicate tissues. So that is very important. Now, in regards to the, refer the information that we have mentioned earlier, why it's so important to care for them? Because the component of the scissors. So you have the jaw, you have the hinge, and then you have the shank, and then you have the two rings. Now, the challenge is, if you don't clean them properly, what is going to happen is the ability to move them is going to be limited. On top of that, what happens in, in this case, because the scissors are super important for the surgeon to allow it to cut, if they're blunt, the cutting edge is not going to be good enough and you're going to have problems. And most often the problems are related to corrosion. So if you use like brushes that have metallic edges, you can actually damage the, the sharp edge of these Caesars and that will be leading to problems. That is number one. Number two issue is if you have dry blood, as we have mentioned earlier, the ability to move them and the dexterity in, in that, they're not going to be able to cut very well. So that is a problem because if you're in the middle of the surgery and you can cut the tissue properly, you can traumatize the tissue on top of the fact that you can cause major problem. Why? Because it's a vessel you're cutting and the scissors is not properly cutting, you can damage the vessel and then you have a problem in that regards. So here is the Holson Hager instrument uh, needle driver or needle holder as you, if you want to if you want to call it as such. So the difference between well what is a needle what is a needle driver? The needle driver has the ability to hold the needle and it allows to penetrate the tissue. Now there are different types of needle drivers. So the, the most common one, the one that I prefer uh, for my uh, surgery is called the Olsen Ager needle driver. And why is so important for me? Because it allows me to hold the needle as well as to cut the suture. So it's for efficiency and speed is super valuable. So the reason why I like it, because I can hold it and then it has sharp edges they have a function to cut the suture. So as, uh, as I'm tying the knot, I can just cut it instead of grabbing instead of grabbing the needle, the scissor, and then cut my suture. That slows the process down. So this is called the Holson Ager needle driver. The other one is called the Mayo Ager needle driver. The difference is as the difference between the two is that the Olsen Ager has jaws are thinner more delicate, more sophisticated. The Mayo needle driver has a very thick jaws and does not have the sharp edges that I like to share is the importance of the, for the Holson Ager needle driver is the sharp edge they're utilized to cut suture only. I've seen, I've seen people trying to cut pins, very K wires, they're called K wires, pins for orthopedics using this, this alternator, very, very delicate, delicate instruments for things that are not meant to be used. In addition to that, what I found is utilizing these, um, these instruments to pull pins when they're placed with, uh, with a drill, and then the drill is two, is the jaw, or the, the, the actual tip of the drill does not allow, is, is, is too big to allow the retrieval of the pin. And they use this very expensive, needle drivers to pull them and damaging the tungsten carbide surface and then what happens is the ability to hold those needles is not is not there so please be very very mindful of that the other thing that is important in regards to um, maintaining despite the cleanliness maintaining them sharp is to serve them so they have to be regularly serviced to ensure that the sharp edges of these um, instruments as well as the jaws as well as the ratchet and the hinge is maintained to the high standards. Let's talk about the scalpel handle. 
So why so important? Because without that, you can't cut anything. So the scalpel handle has multiple serration. And the reason why they are present on the surface is to be able to hold it properly and not to slip. And one of the concerns is if you drop that, that instrument at that slot gets damaged. Now you're doing an operation, you're cutting tissue, that blade can potentially slip out. So it's a big problem. So regarding the way you hold at uh, um, the way you hold the blade holder is very, very important because the, the impact with the forces, the non-controlled forces during the process of cutting, the, the best, in my opinion, way to handle is a pencil, handle, handling, pencil handling technique, which basically allows to control with the portion of your hand by placing the blade between your index finger and the thumb, that controls it. You can use your wrist over the body part that you're cutting to control it. A lot of people, mostly young students and young doctors, what they do, they grab it like that. And then when they go in, they have no ability to control the resistance or their forces. And they can unintentionally, they can penetrate tissue and then create a big mess. So pencil, grip, Handling technique is super important for these type of cases. Let's talk about hemostats. So different types of hemostats. So what the hemostats are the ability to clamp vessels, tissues, mostly vessels, and they're different sizes. So the smallest one, they're called mosquito hemostats, which is basically mosquito small as the way I remember. The other ones are a little bigger, can be classified, they would be called cryo, carmol, or kelly. And the only difference between all of them is the degree of serration that present over the surface of the jaw. So most of them, in this case, will be the Kelly and the Cryo hemostats have serration. They're transverse to the axis of that jaw. And they're actually, for the Kelly, they're halfway. For the Cryo, they're all the way down. And then for the Carmolt, they're actually big, big, we don't have them here, but they're big clamps, hemoclamps. What they do, they are utilized for big tissue, like uh, big vessels or uh, pedicles, ovarian pedicles, or uterine bodies, or uterine horns. Those are utilized for that. And the difference is that the actual serration is longitudinal instead of being transverse. And in the case of the mosquito hemostats, the same thing. They have this transverse serration. Now, why is so important? Uh, cleaning. I'll go back to what we, have, we were mentioning earlier. If you have all this serration and those clamps are holding vessels for you to control hemostasis and there is blood or organic material that can interfere with the proper clamping. And then what you, the end result to that is that potentially you're not going to be able to clamp the vessel and then you're going to have hemorrhage. The other big problem with hemo, hemostats is the, what we call the ratchet system. So the ratchet system allows to lock them in and then you can leave them in place. Think about, let's imagine you, we have a big vessel and a big dog and you put these clamps on it and then you clamp it and then you get your suture and then the ratchet system now is not adequately locked that can lead to a massive hemorrhage and the patient can be compromised. So very importantly, again, it goes back to caring for the instrumentation. Make sure those, uh, the box lock, which is the junction between the shank and the jaw of that instrument is properly cleaned. Importantly, uh, seconds, the other thing that is very important is to make sure you don't bend them by dropping them or handling with not much care, you can bend them. As you bend them, the ratchet system, which is the clamping, the, the clamping system, uh, it's called the locking system, is not adequate. So if that clamping system or locking system is not good, they can, they can separate and then you're gonna have a problem. Let's mention the importance of the forceps. So there are different types of forcep. One is called the brown adsen. And the way I remember, brown adsen have multiple serration at the level of the tip of the thumb forcep. And the reason why they are so important because are atraumatic. 
So you can grab tissue. Please do not grab skin because you traumatize even with this brown adsen. And the other thing that the, these um, thumb forceps have, have this serration on the surface. So to allow those fingers not to slip. Regarding the brown adsen, they have no teeth and they have this multiple serration and they're atraumatic. The other one that is called the adsen, they have teeth and they allow a better grasping of tissue like fascia and most, most importantly, should not or never be used for skin grasping. Regarding the uh, care for thumb forceps, they have a spring system. So that allows you to close them and then they open up, close them and open up. So what happens is during the process of cleaning, if an experienced technician takes them apart, separates them to allow the brush to get into the separation portion of that, they can traumatize them, I can damage them, and they will not be able to be functioning properly, will not be able to be used properly. So very importantly, don't separate the spring system, and then if they're getting damaged, service them or replace them. Let's talk about the cleanliness of the OR. So we mentioned surgical instrumentation, how to care for them, now how to care for the OR. The OR has very important equipment, very expensive, and they need to be maintained as well as kept clean. So the table, any surfaces, ideally you don't want anything that is not needed in the OR, except the table, an aesthetic machine, and then all the equipment as far as monitoring. Why is super important? Because surface collects dust. And as you know, dust unfortunately is, is a contaminant. Mostly if you have dust that is built up on the surgical lamp, and then you're moving the lamp on top of the surgical field, and then the, cl the, la the lamp has not been cleaned, all that dust is going to be falling into the, into the field that is going to lead to contamination. So the other thing that is important in regards to the floor is imperative that the floor does not have any grout, because that allows bacteria, blood, to, or urine, or fecal matter to to sit in and then and then cause a problem because the ability to properly disinfect the surface is not going to be achieved. What is very important, depending on the operation that you have, that you designate a soft tissue room where you can do all the contaminated uh, procedures versus a sterile orthopedic room. We call them uh, the ortho room versus soft tissue room. At the ortho room, you do all those very, very delicate surgery, uh, knee surgeries, fractures, where the sterility must be maintained at all costs. And uh, very importantly, at the end of the day, the rooms have to be inspected. Why so important? To minimize any potential risk of contaminating and allowing the bacterial load to raise for the following day procedure. So all the surgical lamps have to be cleaned, all the surfaces have to be maintained and wiped, including the floor, the tables have to be separated, cleaned, and then the rooms have to be closed, shut. Regarding the personnel, no personnel, nurses or doctors are allowed to walk in without surgical mask, without surgical hats or coverall, and they must wear an appropriate attire that is indicated for surgical uh, environments. So in preparation to entry the OR, what is very important is that the surgeon's assistant are scrubbed in, they're scrubbing properly. So there's a contact time, uh, depending on the solution that we use. There are now new products that you can just, the contact time is very, very reduced compared to the betadine and chlorhexidine based uh, products for scrubbing. So once, once, the, once the doctor is scrubbed, will be approaching the OR, and most often the sinks are very close to the OR uh, suites. So you go close to the OR, the nurses will be opening the uh, gown in a sterile manner and opening the gloves. Some surgeons like to be gowned up by a nurse that is scrubbed in. Other surgeons like to gown themselves. That is, that is about um, surgical surgeon preference. Once they are gowned up and then the gloves are placed, the very important point is to minimize any potential body movement. In, re in relation to your hands, 
you know, this is not allowed, this is not allowed. Any, any, any body movement that is below your waist is considered contamination. Any, any surfaces or any portion of the gown that is from your collarbone up is not, is not sterile. So the sterility has to be maintained with this specific portion of your body. The umbilical, the waist, as well as the collarbone. And then what you do is ensuring that during the draping process, which is applying these paper drapes over the the patient, that the patient was scrubbed properly. A lot of times the scrubbing is not done, is not done well from inexperienced people. So there is a specific way we scrub patients. We go from it's called a circular mode. You go from the center and then you walk your way out. So you collect any potential dirt from the center of the area where you're going to be making the approach and then you walk your way out. So by removing any potential contaminants. So once the patient is, um, is properly scrubbed, the surgeon is ready to go in, is ready to start draping. The other thing that's important is to ensure that when you place your drapes over the patient, you don't go from a dirty area to a clean area. So you have to start draping the patient properly by placing the drape over the surgical field that has been sterilized. And then after that, don't move it. Because if you move those drapes, you have a greater chance of contamination. And they use these instruments to, to stabilize those drapes and then to create that area, that window of, um, of surgical, where the surgical field is going to be. Um, in regards to the nurses uh, opening instruments and opening packs, uh, pouches as we have spoken in relation to how everything is being prepared, what is important is the personnel is trained. So the opening packs seems very easy but can be very, very, um, can be very challenging, mostly by opening sutures. The packs are very, uh, sometimes are very tight, so you can regrab it, and by regrabbing you can contaminate the content. Or when you open a drape, I'm sorry, when you open a surgical pack, they must inspect it. Is the surgical pack sterile? Is the, is the surgical pack damaged? Are the drape damaged? If you have any type of damage, you're contaminating the whole surgery. So the role of the nurse is to inspect the packs, is to make sure whatever is being given to the surgeon is is properly sterilized and at the same time is not contaminated. Then the pack is opened, the surgery starts, and again, the second checkpoint is done by the surgeon, ensuring that all the instruments are sterile by checking the strip inside the, um, the pack, the surgical pack, as well as inspecting the instruments. If they have any dry blood, any organic matter, anything like that, the pack should be discarded and the patient should be redraped. Breaking of sterility can contaminate the patient. Once the surgery is completed, the patient is, is moved out of the OR into the treatment area. And then again, very importantly, is getting the room ready for the second surgery. So multiple people walk in, again, wearing proper attire. The floor is clean, the table is clean, the anesthesia is shut off. Um, the tubing of the anesthesia must be checked to ensure there is not condensation or any vomit that potentially can happen during surgery. So the tubing of the anesthesia might need to be replaced. After that, the second patient comes in, and then at the end of the day, we close the room after breaking down everything, breaking down the equipment and clean them with special disinfectant, and then we get the surgical room ready for the following day. Thank you so much for listening to us and uh, for uh, liking this content. And if you'd like to receive more, please uh, follow us on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, on the website, which is theanimalsurgicalcenter.com. And then please subscribe to this channel. It's a phenomenal content and please like and share with your friends. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.